Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Croeso. My name is Helen House and I'm the director of the Bevan Commission, the leading think tank for health and care in Wales. And um, I'm really pleased to welcome you all here today. I think you will have just seen the, um, the video that um, we put together. Um, and what a powerful reminder of just why we are all here today that represents. A reminder of the huge challenges we all face. A reminder of the numbers affected, the real people that sit behind all of the data. And sometimes I'm sure like you, the data can go over your head and, and, it, and sometimes can be meaningless. But there are real people affected in all of this. A reminder of the impact this has on people, on staff, on services, both now and in the future. And also a reminder on the impact on all of us here today because we are people and inevitably this is going to have a huge and considerable impact on all of us and our and our children for many years to come we recognize this is actually everybody's business it is not just this you know the the responsibility of the health or the care system we're all part of finding the solutions indeed we're all part of the solution and we're not and this is not just somebody else's responsibility so can i thank you all for attending here today and welcome your contribution in helping us together find better solutions for us together in wales um, i'd like to thank uh, also just a brief mention to professor sir mans Lailwood, who has joined us today but he's in the background unfortunately sir mans has been really unwell with long covid for the last eight months and so he's just getting back on his feet and again a really powerful and close uh, reminder of, of the challenge that we have in front of us. I think it's fair to say that um, uh, solutions cannot for, for the future cannot be just uh, tinkering around the edges, they also cannot be just reverting back to norm. We must be brave and bold as we find these solutions and we must all be prepared to change. Many people find change difficult, uh, whether you're a patient, member of the public or somebody in the system. But, and, you know, we have to find a way together to do that. And we must be prepared to make some of the really difficult decisions um, uh, alone. We can't do this alone either. We must work together. Wales is a relatively small country um, and together we can punch way above our weight. So the combination of working with our partners today, our partners, the Institute for Welsh Affairs, uh, the NHS Confederation, Social Care Wales, CHCs, and of course you, because you are all partners in this process, is incredibly powerful. Very briefly, today's session is the first in the series of the Bevan Commission's Doing Things Differently. They are about, today's about some of those wider tough choices, particularly out, that sit outside of traditional health and care services. Next week, which is 11th of February, is about really looking at the systems and the processes and particularly inside, particularly looking at issues around the huge backlogs and the, and, and, and the issues that face us in working together with, uh, uh, in moving that forward. The fourth, the third series on the 4th of March is a cross-party debate and that will allow you to get an insight into what our uh, uh, party uh, politicians and health spokespeople uh, propose for uh, they are, uh, uh, for taking this forward pre-elections. So the presentations we have uh, today as part of the panel are just different perspectives. They're not right nor wrong. They are literally different people that we've brought together around the table. And so we have panelists views. We have questions from you, the audience. So please make sure you send in your questions on chat. Please use Twitter as well. And we also have brought for the first time, really, uh, expert and expert two expert listeners to give us a reflection on what they have heard from their perspective. I'm going to hand over to Oriel now, who's the director of the Welsh uh, Institute of Welsh Affairs. Thanks very much indeed, Helen, and I'm really pleased to be joining you all this afternoon. We were very pleased as the IWA to be partnering with the Bevan Commission on this series. 
Uh, some of you will know that we've had a series of Rethinking Wales sessions and we're supported by the Carnegie UK Trust to take part in, in this and are co-badging it as one of those sessions too. In that series, we're really keen to be, to be having cross-sector conversations because none of these things can be dealt with in isolation anymore. We've learned, we've learned that fairly and squarely over the last year. Um, and there's a strong focus on well-being and everybody's well-being. And we know, obviously, that the key issue at the moment is health inequality and how the pandemic has exerted existing health inequalities. I wanted to turn attention to the uh, Health Foundation into the impact of health inequalities. Um, and we held a round table on this. Today. If you have evidence you'd like to share with that, do please check on their website. Um, doing things differently, I think Helen has covered most of it, so I want to get into the substantive conversation next with our panellists. I'd really like to underscore that these are brave decisions that need to be made and need to be taken. And we have to be thinking much, much longer term than we are at the moment. Uh, we know that the pandemic has exacerbated health inequalities, as I said, and also that it is, it is uh, um, affecting particular groups of the population and particular people working in particular sectors differently too. So we need to be thinking outside of how we have thought in the past, and many of you will have been doing that already over the last year. I think we have a hashtag for the conversation on Twitter, which is hashtag doing things differently. So do please share the conversation as you go along, both in the chat and say hello in the chat and externally on Twitter to engage as many people as possible. This is a Wales wide conversation that needs to be happening over the next over the next months and years. This is a, a long game that we are going to be in for a long time. Helen, I think we'll go back to you for the uh, panel now, please. Welcome everyone, it's really delightful to see uh, um, everyone on the screen, all of our panellists and very quickly I'm just going to introduce them very quickly and go into the first question. For the next 45 minutes we'll be inviting um, our panellists to add their views and their comments and then we'll come to you for questions so keep thinking of your questions. So we have Dame Sue Bailey who's a Bevan Commissioner, a background in psychiatry and uh, she is a chair of the uh, Centre for Mental Health. We have uh, Laura McAllister who is a professor of, at Cardiff at the Wales Governance Centre. Uh, she is renowned for her work in, in sports and was chair of Sports Wales but also other political, uh, wider political uh, um, policy areas. Kalechi Nonam Hayes, uh, Director of Public Health in Coombe Tav. Um, Kalechi leads uh, innovation and improvement as a background in infectious diseases and has a particular interest in reducing health inequalities. Perfect solutions there then. You will expect the answers then, Kalechi. And Dave, finally, Dave, thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. Dave is the Director of uh, Social Services and Housing uh, uh, with the Philly County Council and has a background in social care and housing and has been president of ADSS and indeed represents Director of Social Services on the National Transformation Board. Welcome everyone. I'm going to go straight into the first question um, and, and I'll come round and ask, invite you all individually to, to come back. So the first question is, what are the tough choices we will need to make in responding, recovering and refocusing from COVID? I'm going to come to um, Kalechi first on this one. Thank you, Helen. Um, I, I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think there is something about the framing of uh, these as choices, and and I think that's 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 an interesting one because when we talk about choices, then it's sometimes either or, and and clearly there will be either ors here, but there will also be both ands. So um, during our response to this pandemic, uh, many of you will recognise that sometimes there's been almost a, a choice between economy and health. And, and, and sometimes I, I think there's got to be that recognition. It's been a bit of a forced dichotomy uh, because it is both the economy and health. Um, uh, as, as we come out of this pandemic, I, I, I am struck by the, um, the, the long tail of impacts that we are going to have to respond to 
Um, so I work in the NHS and and I know very much that um, elective waiting lists are building up and there are people uh, who are accumulating vulnerability and need significantly in the community. When this is all over, I think there will be a desire across the board to try and get through some of that need and as much of that need in the population as possible. As we do that, I think make is how do we choose between the health, the well-being of NHS staff who are going to be crucial to helping us get through that need that is accumulated in the community versus the need of the wider community. And I, and I almost hesitate to say that because it's, it, it, it sounds like a choice that we have to make, but it's not going to be an easy choice. How do you choose between the needs that are accumulated in your community uh, versus the health and well-being of staff who you are going to need to be able to exhaust that need? That's going to be a very challenging one for us. Uh, and I say that very conscious that uh, NHS staff are... Um, for many of them, they are at the end of their ropes. It's been an incredibly challenging one year so far. That's going to be a very tough choice. S thank, thank you, Telechi. I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Telechi. I'm going to move on and ask Sue to join and give her views as to what you think are those really tough choices. Um, I think. <laughs> All choices are tough, but that doesn't mean to say that they're not possible. Embedded in Bevan are the principles of prudent healthcare and choosing wisely. I would agree with my colleague from Public Health. There will be no health without public health, and we have to have a healthy workforce. And the economy is about a health creating society. And I think one of the ways forward has got to be to look at us, every one of us, so I may be a doctor by day, but I'm a grandparent by night. We've all got different roles and we have to look at how we all play our part. Um, and you're quite right, the, the, the mental health paradigm has shifted to the right. So we have more people who are not healthy, who don't have mental health, who aren't coping, who are struggling and unwell. And that reflects differently in healthcare staff, depending on their individual circumstances. And we have to look at bespoke solutions for that. And it's not impossible if we flex the workforce. And I think we have to look at different ways of delivering a workforce. And for staff, I think we, we've lots of experience in Wales and in England. We know the impact of trauma, whether it was Aberfan or whether it was the Manchester Arena where I live. And we know that often the impact doesn't really kick in for up to three years later. So we have to have something for the acuity and the crisis response to healthcare staff. And then we have to build in something continually. Wales has got large rural areas, so you've become very experienced at using AI as an intelligent partner in how we respond to mental health needs. So I think we can draw that in. And we have to draw in the whole community um, we haven't mentioned inequalities and maybe I'll take that in another round, but we have to understand that health and social care staff have had very different experiences depending on where they're working. And we have to be careful not to home in and just assume that everybody's experience <coughs> is the same. And that's why we have to ask and listen and actually tailor it round. And that needn't take a lot of time and it can be cost effective. So we have to have hope and determination. Thank you, Sue. Uh, key messages there, ask and listen, uh, hope and determination and plan for the long term. Dave, I'm gonna to come to you next. You, you bring a very, a, a different perspective. You're, you're outside of you know, health, but you're very much in the social care and those communities that are absolutely crucial uh, in, in all of this. What's your take on what do you see some of the tough choices being? I think there's several. Uh, I think a little bit, a bit like in the NHS, we, we've had to make some tough choices into services we continued with uh, and which services we put on hold as the sort of pandemic emerged. Um, I suppose like everywhere else, we, we've concentrated on the acute services, so our residential care and nursing care homes, which have been absolutely decimated um, by this virus. Uh, and indeed our domiciliary care services in the community. 
I suppose what I am a little concerned about at the moment is the impact of all of that on unpaid carers. Um, many of the services which we put on hold and switched off really have impacted on unpaid carers in a big way. Um, we've tried to follow that through in a sense that we've made people try to make people uh, make sure that some people have had some support. But they certainly I haven't had for an extended period of time now the level of service that they previously enjoyed. And that is going to take its toll. It's going to take its toll on the unpaid carers and indeed the, the people that they care for. And I think how we emerge from that and, and basically prioritise those unpaid carers at a time where there's going to be lots and lots of calls on our services, I think is, is a key um, choice that we'll have to make going forward. Um, I think some of the other choices we have, we don't really understand yet. What is COVID going to do in terms of the types of services that we need to provide moving forward? Um, I think it's not really a question of just going back and switching on what we had before and um, when all of this calms down, hopefully. Um, I think, you know, things like long COVID, uh, the mental health consequences of what people in various places have gone through in the last 12 months might mean we need to look at services very different. Now, in going into the economic climate that we're about to go in, if we're not there already, um, that introduction of new services is going to be really challenging because they may well have to come at the expense of some of the services that we've already got. And certainly from a social care point of view, I think anyone that does my job will be sort of littered with experiences of just how difficult it is both with the public and with politicians to take services away. But if we are truly going to make the services that we've got fit for purpose and really concentrate on those people who need our help most, then the decommissioned services is going to be just as important as, as commissioning services. Thank you, Dave. Really important points there, because uh, particularly around carers, if the carers are, you know, if the carers go, then of course the impact is huge, the ramifications of that, and it's probably something we've not heard a great deal about. Um, and 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 also, you know, this balance between new services and decommissioning, and and I think we're it's fair to say we're very good at adding services, but we're not very good at at stopping services that either perhaps are not as effective, not as efficient, or even not needed in the same way. So real challenge there. Laura, can I come to you and, and get your take on, on this? Because I know that, um, you know, the others have covered some areas, but, it, you know, let's it, be interested in your take. Uh, thank you, Helen. Uh, everybody. Yeah, I mean, I think I've got the, the luxurious position of not being a, a health or social care practitioner. Um, clearly, I work around areas of public policy, but I'm also able to step back a little bit and consider the, the wider small p political environment. I think the first thing to say really is that there's no doubt whatsoever that we need to at least rehearse the arguments for completely resetting our society. I think COVID has shown us more than anything that we've got our values wrong in some cases. Dave alluded there to the absolutely scandalous situation around care homes you know across the world not just in the uk and wales um, and i think we need to really um take this opportunity to consider a very differently calibrated society and i think that will have a massive impact on health and social care in the future um if i can quote gramsci it's, it's in a strange environment to do that but you know this is where i think we lie at the moment gramsci said i'm a pessimist because of intelligence but an optimist because of will. And I, and I, what gives me hope out of that statement is that there's a real kind of belief, I think, in Wales now that we do need to uh, reorientate our services and the delivery of our services, and indeed the foundations upon which we manage our politics and society. So let's be optimistic for a moment and think about how we can uh, change things to create a better environment. Um, I've been banging on for a long time now about the so-called Overton window some of you will know about this, a theory developed um, at a fairly conservative think tank in Michigan. And basically it was referring to the kind of possible policy options that governments and the, all agencies have at any one moment. And usually there's a kind of linear scale of possible choices for policy interventions. But generally speaking, they happen very much in the middle of that window frame with the options at either extreme end uh, ignored. And I think the, th the thing about COVID and not just COVID, but Brexit and the politics that exists at the moment is that window has been blown wide open. 
and it gives us an opportunity to think about a really radical um, scenario for the future of Welsh public service delivery. But I mean, look, I'm not naive. Um, most of you are working, you know, at the coal face, so I know how hard it is to try and repair um, the the NHS in the first instance. But all of our services after such a brutal, you know, and violently disruptive uh, period. But let me just say one thing from my own perspective, as somebody who's worked obviously in public policy relating to health, sport, and physical activity. I think if we're going to try and build a new form of social contract between those of us who deliver and the people, then we need to think a lot more about preventative interventions, um, very, very pertinent in health, obviously. Um, but we've also got to think about um, stopping the scenario where we see ourselves as deliverers and uh, people out there as recipients of the services. I mean, I think we're, we're all in this together, quite frankly, and I think COVID has underlined that more than anything. And I just sense there's a real appetite now, the will, the Gramscian will amongst the Welsh people to actually engage with an improved uh, health and social care offering. Everybody has been touched in some way by this over the past year and a half. And there's a real kind of sense of wanting to, to get some proper buy-in. Um, and the final thing I'll say is that I don't think this is about legislation, actually, or massive policy change. But, but if it is, we've got the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act as our framework. And I think we need to really give that some legs, you know, make it live for people. Because the truth is, nobody knows what the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act is outside Cates Park and Cardiff Bay and the local authorities. You know, we need this to be hitting ordinary people and at least some understanding of it amongst ordinary people. And then what I really think needs to happen is some kind of behavioural and attitudinal switches in how we all behave, whether we're leaders in this sector or whether we're recipients of services. Um, I think if we can become more self-critical, if we can become more aware of opportunities that come from crises, um, as we have done, in fact, during COVID, then I think it augurs well for, you know, less, less the pessimism that Gramsci talked about and more the optimism and buying into the kind of goodwill that we have as a nation and as a society now. Thank you, Laura. I have some really interesting points there around, particularly around the the optimism. You you know this it, the time is nigh. Um, I do hope that you are right in that we uh, we can engage people in this time for change. I think we've talked for some time about the need to rebalance that passive recipients of care versus active participants in their care. Uh, we do things to people, we bring them places, we do things and we send them away. So I really do hope that the, the optimism and the, the, the optimistic aspects that you pointed to are, are realized. Um, I also think this, uh, in terms of some of the behavioral and attitudinal change, let's hope that we can take people with us on that and and i think the point you make about being self-critical let's be open and receptive to looking and learning about ourselves but also from others as well okay i'm going to move into the second question time is moving on and this is really about the how and and particularly uh, the most vulnerable um i'm really interested in in how we might support the most vulnerable in communities and address the needs across all our communities, whether they're rural, urban, or, or indeed valleys. You know, we, we know that this is gonna hit, we know this has already hit um, the poorest in our communities worst. Um, how, how are we going to support these in moving forward so it doesn't get worse? Um, I'm gonna to go to Dave first. Dave, what's your um, take on this one? I think I think a starting point for me is support is a very broad church, isn't it? In a sense, so are we clear what we mean by support? Um, I think you know historically what people have faced is they're, they're assessed in terms of what services we they have as a, or we have rather than necessarily what services they may need. And I think certainly from at the local level here, the major learning that we've had from this epidemic. Um, is really catching people early, as early as possible, and really spending time with those people to understand what is it that is causing them the difficulty they're facing. That may be health related, it may be physically, it may be financial, uh, it, it, it may be mental health, it could be a whole range of things. Um, but what we've certainly found from our own experiences is as those conversations have taken place, 
Um, the support that we've given people has been very different to what they historically might have received, where perhaps we'd have come in, they would have almost asked us for a service. Uh, we'd have said, yeah, you're eligible, and away we would have gone. Uh, and certainly, you know, I'm sorry to come back to mental health, but it is something that vexes me quite a lot at the moment. When we, we do that work with people in terms of what is causing them those difficulties from a mental health perspective, they're all, quite often very, very difficult and different to what we would anticipate. Um, you know, people having financial difficulties, um, people being unable to pay their rent. Um, part of my responsibilities, I'm also director of housing in the borough. Uh, and a number of people who actually have housing related difficulties. Um, and if we hadn't intervened in the way that we do, they probably would have been packed off to a GP to get medication. So I think understanding what those people's needs are is key. Um, I think all local authorities and health boards very recently have done population needs assessments, um, in, you know, in order to allow our planning. I think there is a pause and reflect in a sense that even some of those are probably six months old. Are they still realistic? Are, are they still valid in, in terms of what people have gone through and what they're going to go through over the next 12 months? Um, so I, I think that's the issue for me is, is, is being clear what we mean by this, what support people need, but actually people telling us what support they want rather than us telling them. I think that needs to be the sea change. A powerful message. We provide services uh, and we have systems we expect people to fit into, but actually, this is about working with people working alongside them. What we as the Bevan Commission would say is, is about true co production in understanding what people's real needs are, and I think intervening early as you've identified. So, uh, Sue, can, uh, can we just get your take on how will we support these most vulnerable? What's your, what's your perspective on this? Well, it bridges across from what Dave said, that we need to understand people in the context of their lives, understand their dis-ease and their disease in a social context and look at all areas of their life. So I, I think the challenge I'd like to put out to everybody is that it's great we're thinking about what we're going to do about physical health care and the vaccination is good news. But I want to ask the question and get your ideas for the Bevan Commission. What is the vaccination for improved mental health? Because it's not going to be a jab in the arm. And it goes to what Dave is saying. And uh, the Centre for Mental Health have done an 18 month long commission on inequalities. So we've done it during, before, during and now COVID. And if you look at that, it has a lot of the key messages. Things have escalated and got hotter and more difficult and more people are in this vulnerable group but the key things are the same so i almost get irritated when we talk about services services are actually people they're the workforce so how do we ramp up a much more flexible workforce i don't understand why we can't have hybrid social care workers and nurses we we really need to alter and meet the need but I think an enhanced community sector role in mental health support. Um, so using the voluntary and community sector, user led organisations on a patch, partnerships with the state services can scale up the approaches, but they need to be rooted in community and they need to be defined by the user experience and outcomes. Um, people use this word all over the place. and I, I saw this happen with young people in Wales when I was doing the work there, but co-production at every level and every service and to challenge that. Um, I, I think it's obvious whatever an individual mental problem maybe somebody has, that actually underneath this, we need a culturally competent and trauma-informed approach to this. It's not just about what's the X treatment for anxiety or depression. We need to be brave and I think this frightens governments and policymakers, we need a commitment to meet all needs. And until that's shouted very loudly, we'll all gravitate back to doing the bit that we do. So you've said it's right place, right time, adapted, particularly for those with learning disability and neurodisability. Whole system approach, let's stop talking about it and lay out what that actually means. So schools, houses, colleges and outcomes. And I think the real challenge to current and future government is have we got the metrics and the measures right for what is accountability and transparency and I also think I 
don't want to see things that so so well we'll we'll measure this over the next 12 months and then we'll do a peer-reviewed paper on it and then we'll you know change it in three years time covid has shown us that we can deliver things within a month we can show what works and how it works and we can take that learning forward and that goes to the heart of how we're going to get regulators to be more flexible so these are very titchy things to be talking about and itchy things because it involves not being as risk averse as we are at the moment and we need that bravery we know what good enough looks like and we need to get on with it so it's a huge opportunity you can see i am optimistic fantastic thank you sue some really again key messages particularly around working with people you know reinforcing that uh, you know whole system approach speed and flexibility absolutely right we've shown we can do it what we don't want to do is revert back, back where we were as you say a long time thank you sue uh, laura i'm going to come just to you and to your perspective on on this yeah i mean I, i'll try and pick up on a few points that were made by sue and dave there um the first one that leaps out at me is how we need to invest in the youngest generation more significantly than we do currently and that poses the question of why currently education is such an underfunded part of the uh, welsh government budget in my opinion and i just think i think the facts speak for themselves really when you weigh up the investment in education versus the investment in other areas and i say that not because i think that the nhs doesn't deserve the hefty bit of the welsh budget that it receives currently but because you know ev everyone has to acknowledge that schools and education are the site where radical generational and behavioral change can happen you know it can't happen at an older age and i think um we we know that if we're going to significantly tackle things like inequality and adverse ch childhood experiences that then lead to adverse adult experiences of course never mind just in mental health but in terms of economics and well-being more generally and i think we've got to really use schools as a site for significant radical change um and i think you know this isn't just about health and well-being although you'd expect me to make the case for you know really preventative um health in the earliest years of school i think it's also about preparing the next generation economically and and to ensure that their economic well-being is protected you know we need to move away from the current qualifications regime that we have to make them much more diverse and qualitative to that are fit for the digital age and i think we need to really ensure that every child is engaged with a sort of digital literacy program and moreover comes out of school bilingual because you know if we're serious about um, some of the really important principles and values of of welsh society we need to make sure that the systems that we do control like education actually deliver for the country um, at large i think the new curriculum by the way gives us a big opportunity around health and well-being but but you know it's it's got to be seized upon and, and enacted um, and and run out very effectively. And before anybody says yes, but where do you get the money from? I mean there are ideas out there, aren't they? I mean one of my colleagues at Cardiff University, Professor Calvin Jones, has talked about this idea of a hypothecated education levy, and some would argue that won't bring in enough money. But for me, that would be about using any additional funds to really uplift the profile and status of our teaching profession. Because you might say, what's that to do with health? Well, it's got everything to do with health, because if we have a skilled teaching workforce that can really uh, deliver in, in amongst pupils who, quite frankly, might not have other opportunities to break free of their disadvantage, if you get my, my gist, then that will give us a massive opportunity to address structural disadvantage across our society. So for me, you know, education is where it stops and starts, quite frankly. And if we don't get that right, I think we, we really will have very little opportunity to tackle the disadvantages and inequalities that we've talked about. Thank you very much, Laura. And that's fascinating that the fundamentals begin within the education and investing in our education of our future generation. Interesting, we were, we were, we're challenging, uh, we're, we're all being challenged really to think outside the box and hypothecated education levies are, but you know, an interesting facet for that. Uh, one could also argue similarly, I guess, for the health and care system, but we'll, we'll come back to that. I, I'm just gonna come on to Kalechi. I'm conscious time is, is moving on. Kalechi, is there anything else you'd like to add to that? 
I, I think it's just fascinating listening to to Laura, Dave, and, and Sue describe. So I won't add any more to, to, to that. The only thing I just want to build on is that concept of whole system approach that Sue uh, made reference to. And I think about it in the context of one public service, and we almost need to, and uh, public services that are wrapped around communities, uh, although we're not going to be uh, structurally one public service, but functionally, can we function and think as one public service wrapped around communities? So that for me is, a, 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 uh, is, is definitely one thing that if we can increasingly uh, take the advantages of the opportunities that COVID gives us, I think getting into that frame of thinking in public services and the way we work with communities would be a wonderful thing to be able to do to support vulnerable people in our communities. So I'll just add to that, but fully that, endorse that, what that's that. Fascinating thought, Kalechi. You know, it sounds very simple. This this one whole system approach. I like the one system, one public service wrapped around people and communities. You know, we've talked about integrated services, integrated working, uh, integrated care for years. Maybe this is the point at which we, we take off on this. Okay, I'm going to come down and just ask um, um, a particular question around mental health. We know this is going to be a big issue for us in the future. And Sue, I just wondered really, you touched on it earlier. What, what, how do you think we, we can begin to, well, we plan and manage really the, the, the mental health impacts of COVID you know, on the population, including our staff? I think we um, have to radically rethink. We have to have, we do need to have accurate um, information, both quantitative and qualitative, about the size of the problem and the nature of the problem. So, the nature and the degree. And again, I'll take you back to the Centre for Mental Health. We've looked at this across whether it's increased impact of impact on mental health or domestic violence, whether it's health and social care workers. And, and you can go to our website and look at the work we've done. And on a policy basis, that is taking traction because government in England are asking our insights now. So that's a state we need to get to, whether our insights are useful. I think in terms of what I'd want to do is to, while we have to deal with the acuity, we have to keep 2035 in mind. So when Laura was talking about education, we have to ask a more fundamental question, what is education for? And a lot of education, in, in terms of becoming a nurturing, good enough parent who's part of the community, has been learned across the world in different communities by listening and the telling of stories. And I think we need to get back to an approach that much more embeds social psychology into everything we do. And what we need to do is to put a social scaffolding in place. And I think mental health can lead and I think the key thing will be to give everybody a generic baseline understanding of what mental health is, what it isn't, what shared phenomena any part of a mental health problem has, wherever you are and whatever's happened to you, and then build on that. So with HEIW, look at how we train people together to understand how to meet need and we layer that up and we, you could almost do that in Wales as a nation. It can be embedded into preschool, school, health and social care, um, world of work, business organisations, and you can layer it in. And that way, the whole thing won't just suddenly overwhelm us. We'll be able to do it. And, and I, it, it needs a plan and it needs a map. And I think a lot of that mapping has been done, but it's not been put together in a social scaffolding. And I, yeah, I am that's... worried, um, obviously, about mental health and acuity, but I think it's easy to say we haven't got enough money or we haven't got enough of this. It's not what you do. It's definitely the way that you do it. So we need to get so on with not... Yeah, not what you do, but the way you do it. And that's, um, you know, that mental health, that scaffolding that you talked about. I know the Commission has, uh, has explored that in the past. Can I just I, I just pause for a slight moment there? We've got a slight problem with our uh, question and, our, uh, and and ask people that if they'd like to post questions, um, could you either send them to uh, the Bevan Commission at swansea.ac.uk, either visit Slido, uh, um, and or um, even post them on Twitter. 
Um, if you could, we've got a slight problem with the logistics there. So please, I'll come back to that, remind you again on some of those. So, um, Kilachi, want anything last to add to some of the mental health side there? understanding the size and nature of the problem and I think this will relate to pretty much everything we, we deal with. We need a fundamentally different way to understanding need vulnerability in our community. So, so I think that's always a wonderful starting point to understand exactly what it is we're dealing with. Before COVID hit us, we were making a lot of progress across Wales on the ACES agenda. And I'm struck by the fact that the brain of the brain of a child grows to 75% of its adult weight in the first 1,001 days of life. So I think that 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 uh, ACs get back to it because that is so fundamental to the the, the mental health of generations to come. Um, uh, at the end of the day, mental health for individuals and communities are always a balance between their challenges and their resources. So and we do a lot of needs assessments and in needs assessments, we look at how, how much, you know, the, the, what are they lacking? I think there is something about understanding what resources uh, can we, what assets can we support communities with? What assets can we put into communities? You will notice in my response, I've left one thing last and that is services. Oftentimes when we talk about mental health, we jump into services. And I really do think that services are a that the backstop there's so much else that we can do in terms of working with communities before we get to services. But ultimately, we must invest in mental health services, particularly child and adolescent mental health services. But I must stress that the services have got to be the last. There is so much else we can do with communities to increase resilience in communities, starting with understanding needs in a very important way. Thanks, Kalechi. Um, increasing the resilience, uh, not, not turning into services first, and looking at the assets and, and particularly um, strengthening the, 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 if you like, the investment in and around ACEs. Absolutely, we've seen, we've got the evidence. We now need to perhaps um, accelerate that. Okay, I'm gonna to come to Dave Ness and I'm gonna ask him a question really around um, better working together. You know, um, we've got a great framework in Wales, I think far better than uh, outside of Wales. We've got a great opportunity, yet we still can't really get really true effective integrated working. And I know Sue touched on it later. How do we, how will we uh, work better together to pull our knowledge, skills and our resources to find this better way forward in working together? How will we really do that? Well, I think, I think my starting point is, is look at what we've achieved over the last 12 months. Um, because, you know, at the start of the pandemic, I think the thing that appealed, uh, appealed to me and struck me most was you had people all over Wales virtually taking off their lanyards and their ID badges and tossing them to one side. And if you walked into a room, you wouldn't know who was from health and who was from West and who was from social care. It didn't matter. But it's taken a pandemic and a national crisis to engender that way of behaving. Um, and I think the danger is, is how do we stop people reverting back to where they've gone before? Now, you know, there are organisational boundaries in that. There are financial boundaries. Of course there are. And there's no point in us pretending they're not. You're right. We do have the frameworks. We've got a pretty extensive regional partnership board mechanism, which is, has been in place for some time. Um, but if I'm honest, I think that that has primarily been um, diverted into almost di um, dealing with them. Um, grant funding. I think how you take those barriers down is you stop talking about health and social care and you talk about some in a Kalachi reference. You talk about public service because mm -hmm. I think this whole issue of integration has been almost hijacked by the health and social care debate. Whereas actually what I've seen over the last 12 months is, is a lot of the support, help and solutions that we've seen have come from other parts of public service and certainly from other parts of local government. So, you know, perhaps we just need to change the narrative. Perhaps we've got to stop, stop talking about integration and let's start talking about what does one public service mean um, and what can we do democratically and politically to make that happen? I, I, I think it's fantastic. And, and, you know, just that, that picture of people taking their lanyards off and their badges, they belong to this. Actually, you know, the, the significance of everybody making this happen. And it is people who make this happen. It's not the organisation or the policies or the 
whatever it is, it's people who will make things happen despite the systems very often. Laura, what about you? Do you have anything to add on that about this? How do we how do we make this work? How do we not revert to norm? And I think that's the temptation is that when when this changes, we'll be reverting back to um, the way we used to work, if you like. How, how do you see that? It's a really difficult one, isn't it? And um, I think Dave made some good points there about the risks that lie ahead. Um, one of, you know, putting my political science hat on for a moment, one of the problems we've got in Wales is that we wouldn't, nobody sensible would choose the political infrastructure that we have to discharge one national public service. Um, you know, I think you know what I'm talking about. We've got a, a massively underpowered Senev in terms of size. And we've got uh, quite plainly too many local authorities. Um, the reality is that can't be dealt with in any speedy way, but we need to work around what we already have. And I think there are a couple of really important principles to follow there. I mean, if you just take um, our ambition, and I, I think everybody could agree that our ambition for health and social care would be to make the NHS less a sickness service and more of a wellness service so that it brings in education and housing and health and mental health um, and even e economic development for that matter and transport and so on to provide the right environment for people to be well so that we're not always treating them um, uh, once they are sick. And of course, there'll always be a role for the NHS to deal with illness and sickness and chronic disease, because unfortunately, humans will always be ill. But it seems to me that that balance is tilted in the wrong direction at the moment. You know, preventative health has been the Cinderella area of health for generations, as far as I can see. I mean, you're the experts, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, it seems illogical to me that we don't have a kind of valued and strategically funded preventative health approach, which, by the way, has to start at the very, very younger stage amongst foundation phase pupils, in my opinion, and that we don't really recognise that if people are incentivised to look after their own health, um, physical activity being the obvious um, one, which, by the way, has had a, a great air in, hasn't it, in the COVID pandemic, you know, where people have really appreciated their hours exercise or their strolls or their runs or whatever they're doing. Um, and I think we need we need to capitalise on that because, you know, in my in my work in sport, you know, it's really interesting to look at what's going on in England. I very rarely say in sport that England are doing anything better than us because genuinely they're not. But in but in England at the moment, fifty percent of funding for leisure comes from health, and that's a real preventative in, uh, uh, intervention. Unfortunately, in Wales, when we talk about leisure and activity and sport, it's it's in the language of luxury, as if it's a, a bolt on you know, nice thing to have. Well, it's not, you know, quite frankly, let's wake up and smell the coffee here. If we don't get our children physically active, we're preparing them for a life of being sedentary, for being economically inactive and for being ill, quite frankly. And the impact of that on the NHS is massive. So I think the kind of connectivity agenda is really, really vitally important. And we need to kind of sell that to each sector, don't we? We, we think about the investment in preventative health and what the spin-offs are in, in a a real monetary way. So a pound spent on physical activity generates a three pound return, whatever, however you want to phase it, phrase it. But these are really important principles because if we if we continue to see the NHS as a sickness service, then we will never ever get to any strategic radical change in my opinion. Thank you, Laura. It's really interesting. I think that there is this consensus here that we're seeing and hearing, and 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 this is around how do we how do we bring this together? We've got all. I think we've got all the parts. It's how do we re-emphasize and um, and prioritize. I, I I'm going to ask each of the panelists. Time is moving on. I'm going to come and just ask you each to give me one of the key things that you think is the most important. Um, in terms of, you know, what do you see as the top thing that we'll need to do differently? And we've seen and heard some of them, some of them and I just want you to say, for me, it's whatever it is. So I'm going to come around and ask you that as a sort of a, a parting and a concluding part of the session then. So I'm going to go to Dave first. Dave, what's the big thing for you? If you had to put your money somewhere and said, this is the number one top thing, we need to get right or change or 
I, I think we have acute recruitment problems and retention problems in social care. And I think we have to start valuing and recognising the role that care staff have within our communities, what they have been through in the last 12 months and what they've delivered quite often for national minimum wage or national living wage, quite frankly, has been absolutely staggering and very humbling. And surely one of the things that has to come out of this is that we recognise and reward those people for the, the skill and dedication they put in. That would be number one for me. Thank you, Dave. And again, we've seen and heard that COVID has just brought that to the surface in a way I don't think anything else could have done previously, but I don't think anybody would disagree with you. They, they, they've gone hugely above and beyond. Laura, what, what would be the one big thing for you in terms of, you know, what's, what's the thing that we walk away today with? Well, well, I've talked already about education. So in the spirit of trying to inject something new into the debate, I mean, I, I'll pick up on Dave's point about valuing things and people and services differently. I mean, I think it was the fashion designer Versace who said values remembered long after price is forgotten. And I think it's something very practical that we could do in Wales is change our procurement regime because, you know, it seems to me when I look at how think public services are procured in Wales, we, we put far too much emphasis on price alone we it, you know the kind of model that we operate in wales and i think it's about 6.3 billion that is procured in wales so this is a hefty sum that could change you know direction quite significantly but the model that we use drives down wages i mean dave alluded to it there with care staff you know um, but it applies to other sectors as well you know i think we need to really revisit what the principles are in our society that make um that can make things better and they will be based on the value that ordinary citizens put on roles so it might be that we have a complete reconfiguration of how wages operate in wales but but it, it's even as simple as as moving away from an economic model where we base everything on on gdp and gva you know that that's not actually what the economy should be about it should be based on uh, green sustainability it should be based on well-being and so on and and we've allowed economists to convince us that there is there are only so many metrics by which you drive an economy and quite frankly there are not and citizens are a bit a bit more savvy than people believe on this agenda so i think the more we can actually recast how we value everything we do in welsh society the more chance there is of actually changing mindsets in terms of what's important to us I think you're right, and I think certainly in you know in the last twelve twelve or twelve months or you know last couple of years we've seen a lot more around social return on investment, and and actually this is about more than just you know the product. It's about that whole thing that sits behind and the values you describe. Kalechi, um, for you, what's the big takeaway from here that we you know what, you know what will we need to do differently? For me, we will need to reorientate the National Health Service from being a service that is organized along what doctors and clinicians do to being organized around what patients and the public need. We need yeah. to reorientate the NHS from being one organized around measures of processes of, and volume of care to one that focuses on the outcomes and the quality of care. And for us to do this, I think we need to, and I'm going to shamelessly borrow from well-born and fathers here, say we need to be courageous enough to respect uncertainty in, in a way we've never done before, but which we've been doing in the last one year by reason of COVID. We need to be curious enough to reach beyond organizational divides and understand how better to work with communities and we need to be clear enough to use data and intelligence to set out a very, very clear vision for what the NHS can be. Thank you, Kalechi. Can I, can I just come back on one point there that, you know, courageous enough to embrace uncertainty. Um, we've been uh, for years um, uh, driven down a evidence based model, uh, which takes time, tends to be medically orientated. I just want, you know, this changing this whole culture so that we learn as we go and we continue to learn as we go um, in an iterative way, I think will be fundamental. And if we can change that, I think we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly see a significant change. And lastly, Sue, um, what for you is the big um, things that we need to do differently 
you know, the one thing that we would, you know, walk away from here with. You need to commit whatever the challenges are, whether they're in policy legislation, that will truly commit in its widest sense to being a health creating society. And to do that, we have to be prepared to not just listen to, but act on the voice of every man, woman, child and person as well. Everybody has something to offer. And I think key to that, right of recognised education and education through every walk of life, is if we learn together, we will work together better and that will deliver what we need for Wales in 2035. So it's learning together to work best together and that can only be done um, from, from the roots of community. And that's really what we need to turn from mantra into practice and we'll enjoy it that's the main thing you know so often things we, we do in life it's oh that's going to be difficult this is something we could all actually enjoy and children the way i i think you're right and, and, and i think there is something though i think there is still this um uh, caution and certainty um hesitation about the concept of working with people as opposed to doing things to people is co-production. We, we talk a lot about it, but actually the fundamentals of doing things with people and understanding the assets they bring to the table, both in terms of their ideas, both in terms of their skills and their understanding. And we ignore this at our peril, I, I, I do believe. And we have a long way to go on that. But we have seen what it can do. We have seen what it can deliver. We have seen the assets that communities can come forward with. So I think from our point of view now, we really need to embrace and build on those. Can I thank you very much for all of your contributions? I found this fascinating. I just hope that we've got captured all of the points that you make because they, they're such a rich um, combination of thoughts that I would hate to uh, lose any aspects. So we will be um, uh, uh, making sure that we capture these later. I'm going to um, ask uh, Oriel to come in. Oriel, are you are you there? I understand we have resolved some of the issues behind the um, the, the question ask, answering. Um, uh, is Oriel able to come in to take forward the questions um, to the panel from the uh, from from the audience? Um, first up, I wanted to come to a question that Mark Temple has raised, which is, why do people think planning is so essential? Because people's needs are dynamic. Shouldn't the service that they require also alter dynamically too? Because sometimes that planning can freeze the system. Now, there are obviously issues around accountability and transparency in there. Kalechi, I'm going to come to you because I can see you doing a bit of nodding uh, there. So just a heads up for you first, please. One of the things that I'm noticing and I'm interested to pick up on with our listeners, uh, Sue Evans and Sylvia Tan shortly, is that the theme around language that we're using here as well. And that, that massive shift to thinking around people not experiencing uh, their problems in terms of the service that they need to go to, but all these things are interconnected. Nobody lives out their life uh, thinking that it's funding or finance or health or education. They, they live out their life in a, in a multiplicity of ways. And those changes both impact on each other and compound each other too, Kalechi, and you know about that from the public health perspective. Can you talk us through a bit about how could services also alter and shift dynamically? Because we've seen that over the last year, haven't we? Yeah, I, I think that's an incredibly um, uh, powerful question. When, when, when we were talking earlier about a fundamentally different way to understand need and vulnerability in our communities, this is partly what I had in mind. So I suppose the issue is not whether or not we need planning. We will need to plan. If you're managing a budget as huge as the NHS is, you will need to plan. I suppose the question is, is planning so... Um, so um what's the right word it, it, planning isn't dynamic and it isn't it isn't dynamic in a way that rec recognizes that people's needs and the needs of communities are dynamic and so what happens is that i'll give a very specific example from you know for those of us who work in public health if you work in public health you'll be very used to the concept of health needs assessments and health needs assessments 
do exactly that. They try to assess the needs of communities. But the problem with those health needs assessments is that they, they measure need at any particular point in time. And they are not gran granular and dynamic enough to capture the fact that people's needs change from time to time. And so you plan on the basis of intelligence you cream uh, in, in, at, at a particular point in time. And what we need is a, a completely different way of a more granular understanding of need and a more dynamic understanding of need and allow the frameworks for planning to change in a way that responds to those needs. So planning is really not the issue. It is the fact that our understanding of need is often very not sufficiently granular and not sufficiently dynamic. They, I'll say this and I'll stop. Uh, you probably know that in 2018 in Kutab Morganot, we introduced a very different way to understand, just coming from this perspective, a very different way to understand population need. And we've been doing population segmentation, risk stratification, trying to understand need in a very dynamic way. And ultimately the aim is that that then informs planning so that planning is more responsive and more dynamic in a way that recognizes um, need. So so absolutely, that, that's a very good question. And, but it, we, we're making um, its early days along those paths, but I completely agree with the thinking, the sentiments behind that. Thank you. Um, Dave, I'm, I'm not going to come to everybody with the same question every time. We don't have time for that, unfortunately. But one of the questions that came through was about, um, you know, you, make, you raised the point about decommission, decommissioning, and I'm just looking through the question here. There isn't a name attached to it, but could you give an example, please, of a service that could be considered, I realise this might be contentious um, in terms of your own uh, responsibilities, um, but let's be bold and let's be brave about it. What services could you consider stopping because its value is either limited or people can find their own solution. Because one of the things that we've seen over the last year, again, is people playing very different roles in terms of community focused and within their own communities and feeling empowered to do that because it because that, that shared sense of purpose was there. Let's look after each other. That's also a message that has come through loud and clear, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. Uh, and, you know, yeah, there is an example. I, I not to cry in this as a sector, but certainly if you look at these services, particularly for older people, um, they were some I mean, almost lo all local authorities took down very early on in a pandemic and the, there were three reasons for that. Um, when the, the, the majority of people who were in who used those services were self-isolated and they were in, in that age group and that health group. Um, two, social distancing almost impossible and three, we needed the staff to put into residential. And now our response to that has been you can't go to a building, you can't go to a building, you can't go to a day centre, but what we are doing with you is we are supporting you within your community in a different way. The feedback I've had in Kofili as a director is the vast majority of people are now coming to us and saying, I, are we going to go back? Can we stay this way? Can we stay being supported in the community? We don't want to go back into big buildings anymore. Uh, and we need to follow that through. So we can de decommission that. There's, you know, It won't be universal. Sure. Um, in the same way, we've got other people chasing us because they do want to go back. But I think it's about looking at it in different ways. Many of these buildings were created in the 70s um, and we've shown people into them because they've been available. I won't name the authority concerned, but I know a local authority where a director um, has struggled to shut the day centre because it's named after an ex-council leader. Um, and, and, you know, it, it would almost be viewed as disrespectful. So the obstacles in taking down these things that have been there for 20, 30, 40 years are huge. Um, but, you know, they, they are quick wins, well, not quick wins, but they are wins that can benefit the people who receive that service in a different way. Uh, and, we, you know, we look at those services in a, in a different way moving forward. Yeah, you but can't I think so, to... Well, Sorry, it's just ahead. difficult, isn't it? But I, I think one of the one of the skills that we lack in Wales is we, is we're very good at commissioning things, or you know, we're, we're much better at commissioning things than we decommission. We we tend to make quite hard work of decommissioning. It gets embroiled in some very very difficult public and political processes, and sometimes I think people look at it and think it's just in a too hard box. So sometimes that's about both initiative itis. And sometimes that's both about leadership as well, because, you know, to, with the best one in the world, you can't take down a plaque that's outside a building and, and put it on a Zoom call and have it, and it have quite the same meaning for the people who are involved in, in that. And also I when it comes so. to the example, you know, you gave in terms of the day services, 
um, the issues around digital um, accessibility for people, whether if some of those services are being offered differently, and that's a different thing to feeling the touch of somebody's hand, isn't it? It's totally, Absolutely. totally different thing. Absolutely. Um, I'm, Sue, I'm going to come to you next. We've had a question from Kerry Jackson, please, which is about, and I'm sure you'll have experienced this as well, in your neck of the woods, which is the third sector has played a really pivotal role in supporting people uh, uh, during the pandemic alongside their public sector colleagues. What role do you see for the third sector in that whole systems approach that you know everybody on the panel has been talking about in, from a slightly different angle? I very much see that as um, increasing and I think in order to happen so that we don't revert to where we were before, it goes back to the basic principle that if the task anybody has is a set of skills to do it and deliver, that we learn together and train together and that we respect the skills of people from the voluntary sector. And that still isn't always the case. And that, that will be the point of turning. And the voluntary sector workers often understand need much better than the practitioner professionals. Um, and, you know, they know who do these services. You know, I mean, I still don't know why we have outpatient departments. Completely an utter waste of time unless you need a high tech assessment. And the voluntary sector is embedded in the community. It can help to bring the professional practitioners into the community and work together and learn from each other. And in mental health, there's lots of examples of that, particularly in France, and it's made much better outcomes. So huge, absolutely golden opportunity to not revert so, to. So there's some really interesting stuff here about how do we listen to people to get their point of view on what both what matters to them in terms of the changes they've experienced positive and negative and what they want to what they want to hold on to over the last year and do we have a systematic way of of doing this and um for those of you who are interested do contact me uh, separately about some of the work that we're involved in in that from the iwa's point of view um laura i'm going to come to you in terms of that kind of reorganization of government because there's that looking outside as well to to bring examples here, and Sue's just raised a good example in terms of, um, I'm sorry, excuse, apologies for noises off from my children just next door. Um, from the point of view of looking at, looking at France's example in terms of mental health. But if, if you know, money comes from, money comes from the central pot and it's divided up to various different ministries, and there is, a, there is a challenge both in terms of the initiative ITIS that Dave has been talking about, also at a ministerial level, and we need to work much more collect collectively across government. If you, if you could start from scratch, how would you organise it? <laughs> well, uh, what a question. Um, but it's a good one. Um, uh, obviously, as I said, I wouldn't start from here, <laughs> but um, nevertheless, we, here is where we are. So um, we have to do something to make it um, different and better. Um, this is going to sound really, really strange because it's kind of counterintuitive. But the first thing I would do is um, invest in political education in school. Um, this is a really fundamental one. Um, now that we've got votes at 16 as well from uh, this May's elections, we need to create a much better informed um, citizenry i don't say electorate because citizenry applies throughout the calendar not just at the time of election so i think this is a really important thing i would change our electoral system uh, there are plans afoot obviously to make it much more representative but i'd get rid of the completely dysfunctional electoral system that we have which nobody understands and which actually compensates parties um, for losing rather than for winning um, I'd increase the size of the Senate so it's a properly functioning parliament. Um, you've heard me bang on about this enough. But, you know, one thing COVID has done is given our nation a little bit of confidence that we do have the ability to run our own affairs. Um, but having said all of that, you know, make sure, make the Senate a properly functioning institution so that it's actually got a body of backbenchers who can scrutinise. But devolution doesn't stop in Cardiff Bay, you know, and, and the other thing that this awful pandemic has shown us is how powerful local and regional government could be if it's um, properly uh, enfranchised in the broader sense of the word. Um, I wouldn't choose to have 22 local authorities uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but I do believe 
that local government is probably the most powerful and important tier of government that any nation has. So if we got that right and actually made our, our tiers of government much more representative, um, probably a little bit less party political, easy to say, much harder to do, much like um, Dave's um, buildings and plaques and so on. And I think that could be a really, really significant change in how we uh, govern ourselves. Um, but, you know, it, it's about seizing this moment for change, isn't it? You know, there's, there's nobody wants to piggyback on a crisis to change things too radically. But at the same time, this is probably the optimum moment for doing something really significant politically as well. So it would be wrong of us not to take that opportunity. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I've got a, a few comments that I'm going to just share with people. There's somebody from the especially Gwyneth Green group about definitely echo that, that we need to embrace speedy, significant, radical change in ensuring sustainable care going forward environmentally and others. And interesting also to read the Chief Medical Officer's report up until August last year, the annual report that came up last week, emphasising that threefold focus on environmental health and animal health in particular, in terms of those three things being need to see together. There's a question, I guess, for um, those of you involved in, in um, and this is particularly Dave Kelechi and Sue, in relation to your cross-sector conversations with others who are not in health and social care. Um, and how formal those are or how informal they are. I know there are obviously bodies like the Public Service Board um, where some of those conversations take place. They still seem to be very both amorphous, unknown, in a, in a learning phase for many of them and, and of varying um, effectiveness across the country. Have you seen a change in those? And does that give you enough of that granularity that we've been talking about in terms of understanding where people are coming from and how they're experiencing what they're experiencing? Because we may have had this shared purpose in terms of survival and support and care over the last year, but everybody has experienced it in very, very different ways. Whether it's whether you're working as a as a taxi taxi driver in the hospitality in, industry, in care, in education, as a parent, particularly as a working mum, homeschooling or supporting your kids to learn at school, whatever whatever it may be, what sort of changes are you seeing in terms of those conversations? Because that language needs to be shared, doesn't it? And that's what we're hearing from this conversation this afternoon, Kalechi. And so again, that's a very good one. I think our um, and and I, and I suspect we wouldn't be the only public service body that is um, having this moment of introspection, because the 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 public services body were um, going on with delivering well-being plans and well-being objectives before COVID came, and then during COVID, it was almost like the PSBs went silent and completely out of the system. But actually what happened was that the PSBs, the relationships that have been nurtured in the PSBs, were the same relationships that came alive in, over the last one year to enable us to respond in the way that we have done. So when the PSB is now in a position where it's introspecting, that's almost that distinction between where we did what we did in terms of a good response, but not necessarily because of the infrastructure of the PSB, but essentially through the relationships of the public services bodies. And I'm talking about the public services and, and all of the other partners, including voluntary and community sectors there. So I, I, there is something about um, those conversations um, based on very, very healthy relationships and not necessarily on the legislative structures that have been set up in the, in the, in the, in the PSBs. So going forward, there will be something, I think, for for policymakers and Welsh governments to think about in terms of whether how much permissions need to be given to these um, uh, public sector partnerships to operate in ways that are more responsive to the needs of their of their communities without necessarily feeling straight jacketed by an existing legislation. I think there's there's a conversation there because it's the relationships that have worked rather than necessarily the legislative structures under which they have to operate. And a, a, a related thing in there is about having conversations with communities and the role of voluntary and community sector agencies or, or bodies. And, and, I, and, I, and I do say this uh, very conscious of, of um, how it might land, but, but my, from my experience, um, um, 
voluntary and community sector bodies do not necessarily equate to community representation. Uh, the, the, the part of the aim is about representing the voice of communities, but actually it doesn't always work that way. So there is a question for me about what do we need to do to invest in the voluntary and community sector to unlock genuine and sustainable community representation question. But I think that that is an important question if we're going to get into that place where we are moving beyond just um, listening to communities to genuinely empowering communities. If you think about Sherry Einstein's ladder of community participation, and right at the bottom of it is informing and consulting, but right at the top of it is genuine citizen empowerment. I think there is an opportunity to un unlock citizen empowerment by supporting voluntary and community sectors. And that starts by not necessarily assuming that they give you genuine community uh, representation from day one. So I think your, your point, particularly about relationships, is, is very well made. My, my only kind of counter challenge is that often people go to the people they already know rather than necessarily the people they don't know. And, and they don't necessarily know how to find the people they don't know as well. And that's been that's been one of the challenges. So how, how you how you find the voices that aren't being heard, which is plays the second part of your points. Uh, Sue and Dave, I'm afraid I'm not going to come to you on the rest of that question because time is running out and I need to go to Sylvia and Sue Evans from uh, the listening perspective. So if uh, I'd just like to say thanks very much indeed to the panellists, to Laura McAllister, to Dave Street, Kelechi Noam and Sue Bailey. Thank you very much indeed. And if we could move to our keynote listeners, please. Great. And I know S Sylvia is there and just hopefully getting her screen on her video on. So Sue, I'm going to come to you first because we were particularly keen from the IWA perspective that this conversation is heard and that there's some feedback both for delegates now but also potentially afterwards as well. What are your reflections immediately? What are your first impressions? What surprised you and what are you encouraged by? Thanks Oriel. I think it's been a great conversation uh, and hopefully the start of some action that we're going to take together. Um, what I've heard, which I think is really helpful, is recognition that we need to think less about services and more about people and their individual needs, uh, flexing to meet those needs in a holistic way really maximizing um, all of the community assets, third sector. So, you know, the, it isn't just the realm of the statutory services. It's very much about thinking holistically. And I, I like the philosophy, think local, act personal. I think that's quite a nice little neat way of trying to focus on a citizen doing things and making decisions at the most appropriate and the, the localest level, if you can, uh, nearest to where those needs are. The other thing I'm hearing is we need a new conversation about how we're valuing, whether that's valuing the workforce, uh, valuing the services, or more importantly, valuing our citizens and recognising that they have many assets and, and answers to the problems that we may have naturally or traditionally thought they need a service. Uh, the other thing I've heard is a real focus on children and young people. You know, they are the future for us. Uh, and I like some of Laura's uh, comments about thinking about education in its widest sense in terms of life skills and life chances. Uh, and making sure we are equipping our youngsters uh, with the right things in, in terms of going forward. The other thing I heard, uh, a strong commitment you know, from our organisation is what can we do to support unpaid carers well? Uh, I think very often their voice is not heard. Uh, and if we didn't have unpaid carers providing that support across Wales for vulnerable children and adults, uh, health and social care would would be in dire straits. So those those are my opening thoughts. I have more, but uh, you may want to uh, ask Sylvia first. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Sylvia. Uh, Sue, sorry, Sylvia. I'm going to come. I'm come to you. So just um, to let everybody know, obviously your 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 role is for Age Camry, Quinnith and Morn um, as yes. independent advocate and social care officer. Um, can you? Can you, hello. Sorry about that. Totally fine. <laughs> Don't worry, totally fine. We've all had that. Um, uh, can you talk through what you, what struck you as, from the conversation we've just been having? Um, I was very encouraged by 
um, everything I was hearing, to be honest, um, particularly for my uh, area, interested in the how the third sector, um, the third, third sector has a big role, I think, to, um, to play in the future um, and then, you know, making the future decisions. Um, the only thing I would ha have in mind was the access, uh, the inequality of access to health and social care at the moment. Um, and also, the only other thing I didn't hear was uh, the importance of planning for late life, whatever whatever age you are. Um, and, but on the whole, it was excellent. And we've got a lot of hard work in front of us, um, but it's, it's sounding very promising. Good. Well, I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're heartened by that. I think there's a. I think yes. you're right. There is a lot of work ahead of us, uh, absolutely, and ahead of us all to take to take this agenda forward, and particularly a lot of work for people who are already absolutely knackered by the last year mm -hmm. and grieving from 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 that. Yeah. And the points I think made earlier on from the panel around how trauma. I think Sue made it in terms of how trauma manifests itself and is compounded over time and comes up in different at different moments in different ways and people's resilience is very is very different and i think we can all look around our friends and families and colleagues and see how people's resilience that ability we talk about resilience and often we don't unpack it enough but that ability to both under withstand shocks you know we've all had this massive shock over the last year but also stresses in the environment about it uh, around yeah. us over which we have no control and uncertainty and can you, I wonder if you have any reflections on that um sorry me um yes what I didn't really say was as health and social care uh, when you work in you know on the ground if you like um what um a lot of people don't understand is that we absorb the anxiety of people and yeah and so we find you know um, that's something that's really important to remember. Um, you say that on a particularly yeah. apposite day because it's um, mental health week for foundation phase actually in schools yeah. across England and Wales at, at the moment. One of the things I helped my nine-year-old do this morning is write a thank you letter to a key worker who was a psychologist uh, in a health board in Wales and talking through what that meant precisely that absorbing of, of, mm. of what her, both her patients but also her colleagues and friends are also dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think, Sue, so coming back to your um, Think Local, Act Personal, very, very pertinent. Um, I'm conscious we're running out of time and I'm going to need to hand over to Helen shortly. Is there, is there, I guess, I wanted to come to each of you, Sue, then Sylvia, please. Just one final challenge to people here today and watching now and because people will listen and watch this session afterwards on the recording if there was one final challenge you wanted to share with people what would it be i think uh, the demonstration that we can make this happen and work as one public service has been evident throughout covid uh, you know and dave's example throw the lanyards away i think getting rid yes. of those barriers that get in the way of you know providing and focusing on the needs of our citizens. Really, we all have to have to act as one public service. And how do you see that happening in terms of that both that leadership and that cross pollination and and the kind of gathering of those stories? Because somebody's got to be doing that together. Uh, it's almost so, thinking if if you're doing something on your own, then you're probably doing it wrong. Uh, you know, so it's almost like getting that mindset that there's probably a better product if you collaborate with other people. And as somebody said during the conversation, you know, really, we have a national treatment service, not a national health service. Our health is very much supported by all of those social and social determinants of health, housing, jobs, etc. Uh, so, you know, we need to pull together and work in that way. And, and I think PSBs and RPBs are a useful mechanism for at least coalescing. And uh, the conversation we had earlier about relationships, it's us who make things happen, not the organisations that we work for or the structures. It's the people in the room. It's, it's only us yeah. who can do it. Yeah, it's only us who can do it. Thank you. Sylvia, what are your final challenge to yeah. people listening today? 
Um, yes, I totally agree with what Dave Street said. Throw away the lanyard uh, in the day-to-day -day work. There's nothing worse than you know turning up in a suit and and with the lanyard and saying I'm so and so, <laughs> and um, and it completely um, if you take away the officialness of your job and you can talk one to one to person. Um, what I would ask everybody to do is to think of the person you're talking to at that time and look at the whole picture of their lives and their needs rather than um, the specific issue. Um, and listen to them in their own words as well. And listen to them in their own words, yes. Great. Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Sue Evans and Sylvia Target. Um, it's a very short amount of time that we've got. I'm going to hand back now to Helen Housen for wrapping up. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Oriel. Thank you, Sue. And thank you, Sylvia. Some really interesting reflections there. And, and it's my job really just to conclude and, and, and to sum up. Firstly, I want to thank everybody involved, both the, 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 the speakers, the panellists, uh, the audience for sending in their questions, apologies for the slight uh, glitch that we had there, but also the listeners. It is interesting to see what people take away. We all will take something different because of our uh, different backgrounds and where we and where we come from. So what we want to do is to make sure this is an ongoing, not just a conversation, but a conversation that translates into action. And, and, and this is fundamental. We've heard about the importance of working together. We've heard we've worked together with our partners. I'd like to thank our partners and to throw out a challenge to, I guess, just them as I say, how might we work together to make some of this actually happen in practice? And I think this is just the start of a, of a process of change that we cannot just allow to stay as a conversation. It has to translate. And I loved some of the key points coming forward from, from, from the panelists commit to a health creating society. So one that actually fundamentally believes in a society that actually this is about health and wellbeing, not just about profit and, and loss. Reorient the health services and the public services around people and their needs and reorient the, the health service to be one of health. We've talked about that for years. Let's look at how we can really substantially support health within the NHS. And we talked about it, Laura, highlight procurement you know that's a huge and powerful tool that we must look at and particularly in the context of our environmental and sustainable future the fairness and a fair and equal society whereby our health and our care workers our our, our carers are recognized and and supported fairly and I guess for me you know one of the, the one I, I I really loved was the idea about a whole public service wrapped around the people and its and its communities, not different badges working against each other. So the challenge for us all is to go away and make this happen. I guess the challenge we've heard it time and again today, the challenge is about being brave, the challenge is about being bold, and the challenge is also about being courageous. So I will ask you all, how bold, brave and courageous are you prepared to do? We have to find the solutions together and we have to work together. How will we do this given the constraints that we operate in? How will we do this given the opportunities we have and the learning that we have from COVID? I would say one of the fundamental messages from the Commission is about being prudent. You work together, co-produce and use all the skills and resources that we have to best effect. The, the skills and resources of people in our communities, the skills and resources of the patients, of all professionals and, and society as a whole. We tend to orientate a service that, 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 that is, is laid there for people to access and, and, and not necessarily addressing the right needs. Be open to change. How open are we? I'm going to ask you all, how open are you to change? How open are you to innovation? And how open are your organisations? It will be up to you to go back and to help stimulate and support and engage the kind of messages that we've got from here to make it work in practice. In other words, create a wider social movement for change from within, not just wait for things to happen from above. And, and, and this is, as I said, everyone's, everyone's business. 
It's everyone's business. We will not do this uh, uh, singularly. And so the question I will leave with you before you go is, what will you do differently when you leave here today? And how will you influence and take forward some of the messages and some of the discussion points that were raised today? So thank you everyone for listening. We do have further sessions coming up. Uh, there's two, two more sessions, as I said at the outset. We will be producing a summary paper from this and we will ensure that we um, that we, we watch out for other Bevan Commission uh, pieces of work and, um, and, and other developments such as this. Um, stay safe, uh, stay well, and we hope you'll join us again soon. Many thanks. <laughs>